the, he managed to escape from the prison for a week. And I mean, we say it like it's something funny, but it's not funny, it's the reality. And the crime for which Haidar and a million and a half other people are imprisoned in Gaza is, is what? It's, it's something that people usually don't speak. But their crime is that they're not Jewish. <laughs> That's their crime. Because if, if you changed one thing about the people of Gaza, the Palestinian people in Gaza, if Israel suddenly recognized them as Jewish, they would, they would open the gates of the ghetto and the people would be invited back to their land. And most of their land is empty. Most of it is empty. This is, there's a great myth that, well, return is not practical because all of the land is occupied by Israelis now and it would be too difficult. Actually, most of the land is empty. But after the ethnic cleansing in 1948, 90% of the population within what became Israel was expelled and reduced to what? About 150,000 people. Uh, in the 63 years since that time, the Palestinian population within Israel has grown to now about 1.4 million, almost 10 times. How many towns, does anybody know, how many new towns and villages uh, has Israel allowed Palestinians within Israel to build in these 63 years for their growing population? Zero. 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 As against about a thousand Jewish settlements and towns that have been built in that town. So one of the consequences of the growth of population and the restriction on land and uh, you know, building, is that Palestinians now within Israel, I'm not talking about the West Bank and Gaza, are moving to where there is housing. And where there is housing is in Jewish towns, because that's the only place they allow construction. So we see a reaction within Israel as Palestinians, citizens of the state, at least supposedly citizens of the state, move to uh, towns which are predominantly Jewish and of course many of which used to be Palestinian before 1948. So an example that really struck me recently from uh, Haaretz, from the Israeli newspaper from the beginning of this month, from November 3rd, and it says, did you see this story? It's an amazing story. In Safad in the north. Safad was plastered with posters on Tuesday denouncing a longtime resident for renting an apartment to three Bedouin studying at the local college, three, three Arab students. The, the apartment owner, Elitz Favieli, had decided to go through with the rental despite threats that his home would be torched. The posters are the latest episode in an ongoing campaign waged by certain Safad residents led by Chief Municipal Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu to halt the influx of Arab students attracted by the college. Because, of course, how many Arabic language universities are there in Israel for the uh, uh, indigenous Palestinian Arabic-speaking population? Zero. Residents who oppose this campaign believe that in light of a recent incident in which three Arab students were brutally attacked, the posters could incite an attack on the 89-year-old Tzvavieli, who is named explicitly on the signs. Tzvavieli, the posters say, is returning the Arabs to Safad. It's a crying shame. Uh, uh, Tzvavieli said, I'm scared, he told Haaretz, but I have an obligation toward these lovely students. They're in school every day and needed a place to sleep at night. A very human and normal uh, response. Uh, and then just some background. A few months, a few months ago, uh, Shmuel Eliyahu, the chief rabbi, the local rabbi, and 17 other rabbis issued a public call to residents 
not to sell or rent apartments to non-Jews. That was followed uh, by an emergency convention three weeks ago at which speakers lashed out against the influx of Arab students. And then about 10 days ago, this is from the beginning of November, uh, three Arab students were physically assaulted, one of whom was, was shot. Now, this incident is not in any way unique. It's not like I'm picking something that is, is rare. I have in front of me, I won't read them all, but just so you, you, you know I'm telling you the truth, countless examples of this, countless. This is from um, uh, October 26th from Yediot Ahronot about the town of Carmiel in Israel. Where is Carmiel? Between Akka and... Okay, in the north as well. Uh, where the deputy mayor of the town placed advertisements in the newspaper to say, this is quoting from the advertisement, residents are welcome to turn to us the moment they become aware of an apartment uh, or a flat which is about to be sold to someone from one of the surrounding Arab villages. Once a flat in Carmiel is sold to an Arab family, family it is a, a solid fact for generations to come. And the deputy mayor claims that uh, they prevented the sale of 30 apartments to Arabs through this system. What's different? Now, this, something like this could happen in Germany. It could happen in the United States. It could happen in any country. But the difference is, in other countries, you have a system, you have a standard that says there must be no discrimination. There are human rights. There, there is recourse. The government must take action to prevent this. You have rights which you can pursue. That's not the case in Israel. On the contrary, this is encouraged by the state, by the authorities. It's the vision, it's the ideal of a so-called Jewish and democratic state. Now, within Israel, there, is, there are a few Israeli Jews who uh, who protest against this, and uh, a few dozen held a demonstration a few weeks ago, and one of them, Professor Aliza Shenhar, said the following: Imagine a university in a certain country, let's say Germany, and a priest forbidding the residents from renting out apartments to Jews. <laughs> I know we're not supposed to make comparisons. It's not me, though. I'm just <laughs> quoting. I'm just quoting from the Israeli press. This is from Yediat Ahronot, an Israeli newspaper. So if somebody who's watching on the video or wants to accuse me of anti-Semitism, they need to send the accusation to Yediat Ahronot, not to me. <laughs> and Continuing the quote from uh, uh, Aliza Shenhar, here we have a chief rabbi whose salary comes from the taxes paid by you and me, and he's telling people not to rent apartments to Arabs at all costs. We are reaching an unbelievably high level of discrimination and racism we never imagined reaching. I feel great shame. Now, it's important that, to know that there are Israeli voices like that, but it's important not to have any illusions. They're very few, and we cannot wait for them to make the change alone. They need our support from the outside through boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. But in my remaining few minutes, I want to talk about some of the other obstacles to the one-state solution. One of them, which I confront all the time, people say, well, you have this very beautiful vision and it sounds so nice, but the problem is Israelis will never accept it. And if you look at the opinion polls, maybe five or ten percent of Israelis uh, are open to this idea. Although, Ilan was telling me yesterday at the recent conference on the one-state solution in Haifa, uh, the, there were a lot of Jews and, and uh, Palestinians there. So there is at least some Israelis who, uh, who are open to this idea. But the point I want to make is that, of course, Israeli Jews are against this idea. And here's where we can learn from another comparison. I kept hearing this 
objection, saying, well, you know, but Israeli Jews will never accept it. So I was curious. I said, well, what about whites in South Africa? Were they open to the idea of a uh, one-person, one-vote democracy before it happened? H how many supported it? Uh, I mean, if they were so much in favor of it, why did, why did it take so long? Why did it take so long? And I actually went back and I, I published this as, as an article and I presented it in, on my first visit to South Africa earlier this year, which was uh, amazing. I went back to the 1980s and I looked at all the newspaper articles, to the opinion polls, which were done among whites in South Africa. And to summarize what you find, until the early 1990s, Remember, Nelson Mandela was re uh, released in 1990, and the first democratic election was in 1994. <clears throat> Until the early 1990s, the number of white South Africans who said we would accept a system of one person, one vote, in a fully democratic South Africa was about, depending on the poll, between 2 and 5%. <laughs> Most said, well, we know apartheid is wrong, but we have to have some system of group rights where, you know, the whites maintain a veto or some, some system that guarantees us uh, uh, a disproportionate say in the country. And that, that didn't happen. In the end, you had a national unity government, a transitional government, and then one person, one vote system. Uh, what made the difference? The difference was two things. One was internal resistance and external pressure on the one hand, which raised the price of the status quo uh, for whites. And the other was the acknowledgement, I think, by uh, the ANC and Nelson Mandela that uh, whites had fears. That, that not all their fears were illegitimate. That they, the question they asked, well, if we let go of power, what will happen to us? Will we be, you know, will we lose everything? Uh, and they were able to address that directly, but without compromising on any principles of democracy and equality. And I think that's a lesson uh, we have to uh, take. The final point, and uh, my time is uh, uh, almost up, is to recognize also that this sort of political transition doesn't lead to utopia. And South Africa is not a utopia. And when I was in South Africa, uh, I saw uh, outside Cape Town, Cape Town is a beautiful city, but if you travel just outside the city to the Cape Flats, you see uh, vast uh, townships, new ones, that have appeared since 1994. Terrible poverty. And people say, aha, you see, Uri Avnery says things like this. Look, the inequality is worse in post-apartheid South Africa. And this is true. But it's important to recognize that the inequality, the economic inequality, is not the result of ending apartheid. What was the alternative to ending apartheid? The inequality in South Africa and the poverty today is the result of apartheid. It's the continuation and the legacy of apartheid. So the, the other lesson we have to take is that you have to go much further than a political settlement. That you have to build economic justice and economic equality into any political settlement. And this has to be from the, from the basic uh, foundation. So um, I believe that this vision is uh, the only realistic possibility to echo Haida's words from yesterday. Uh, I believe that um, in terms of public opinion within Israel and within the Palestinian uh, community, it is uh, gaining ground and uh, can be the majority uh, idea uh, within a very short time and I think it is the most moral and pragmatic solution uh, and I think that 
as German history shows us, basically you have to not only expect the unexpected, but be ready for the unexpected. And that's why we have to have this discussion now. Thank you.